Were you okay? My name is Larry Parlberg. I'm the director of the Lou Wallace Museum, and I want to thank you for putting up with some technical issues as we get going here and for the uh, change of venue that happened this afternoon. We appreciate you all finding us uh, when we realized that the turnout was going to be as, as large as it was. Uh, we realized that Lou Wallace, in his infinite wisdom in 1870, didn't build a big, big enough carriage house. So um, <laughs> we appreciate St. John's letting us uh, jump over here real quickly. Um, I am going to do a quick introduction of Gail Stevens, who is a remarkable person, and I think you'll enjoy the program tonight. She is one of our Wallace scholars. We have researchers across the country. Um, we have about eight of them that actually get to do the fun stuff of looking into <laughs> Lou Wallace and his history or Ben-Hur. And um, we've had, as many of you know, Howard Miller up several times to talk about the Ben-Hur part of Wallace's life. And Gail is one of the folks that tends to look a little bit more at his military career and some of those aspects. So. Um, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Gail has a bachelor's degree in international politics from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. She can explain everything that's going on in Washington today. No. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> she did graduate work at John Hopkins and Harvard Universities, both of which I've heard of. Um, she worked at the Department of Defense for 26 years, retiring in 1994 as a member of the department's senior executive service. Upon retirement, she began her study of the American Civil War. She um, lectures frequently on various Civil War topics um, and got involved really at the Man Battle of Monocacy, the Monocacy Battlefield site, where Major General Lew Wallace had his 1864 campaign that was very successful at many levels, yes, um, but controversial at, at others. Um, in 2002, she won the National Park Service's E.W. Peterkin Award for Contributions to Public Understanding of Civil War History. She's written a lot of articles on Lew Wallace and on Confederate General Jubal Early and his invasion of the North um, for several different Civil War publications. We in Crawfordsville most adore Gail for a book that she wrote on Lew Wallace called The Shadow of Shiloh, uh, Major General Lew Wallace in the Civil War. It was published by the Indiana Historical Society. It looks a lot like that book there. Um, it, was, it came out in October of 2010, and it won the Civil War Forum of New York City's William Henry Seward Award for the best Civil War biography of 2011. It's an, it's an excellent read, um, and there's a lot of military in there, but if you're not a military historian, it is a great history of Lou Wallace. It's, it's wonderfully written. Um, Gail is not only a Wallace Scholar, she is also a former member of our Board of Trustees. She lived for many, many years in Maryland when she was involved with Monocacy. Uh, and then all of a sudden she upped and moved to New Mexico. And so uh, she has written a monograph for the National Park Service about the 1930s archaeological excavation of an ancient Pueblo site, which is kind of the centerpiece of the Coronado um, historic site. And on a very selfish note, now that she's done with that, maybe she can do Lou Wallace in New Mexico. So we'll see. Um, but with no further ado, Gail Stevens. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Um, the reason I moved to New Mexico truly was to begin to look at Lou Wallace in New Mexico and to find out, because I'm sure it's there, he did more than pardon Billy the Kid. And then, according to some people, renege on it. Um, it is great to be in Crawfordsville. It's always great to be in a city that, that recognizes its history and pays attention to it. And by the way, if anybody can't hear me, raise your hands and I'll project some more. <laughs> okay, all righty, I will project some more. So, to start my talk. Um, we often hear, we hear a lot of, about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And we hear a lot that often that it was a single deranged man, John Wilkes Booth. Well, what I'm going to talk, what I'm going to tell you tonight, my thesis. First of all, John Wilkes Booth was not deranged. He was a very smart man who pulled together a motley crew of fellow conspirators, fellow Confederate adherents, who, well, pulled off um, one of the worst events of the 19th century, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. So I'm going to discuss tonight the conspirators, their plot, their capture, 
their trial. And in doing that, I'll hit some of the, uh, the, many, con the many controversies. And I'm also going to talk about Wallace's painting, The Conspirators, and what it tells us about Lou Wallace and what he thought about the conspirators, because, of course, Wallace was on the military commission that tried them. So, on the night of April 11th, Abraham Lincoln gave a speech. It was two days after Lee had surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. This was in Washington, D.C., of course, and there was jubilation everywhere, celebrations in the streets. People were actually let out of work for the day, which was unusual in the 19th century. So people went to the White House that night expecting Lincoln to give a speech of celebration. But Lincoln didn't do that. He gave a speech about the future, particularly what they intended, what he intended to do about the Confederate states, the citizens of those states, and the newly freed slaves. In the course of that speech, he said those words, which meant he intended to give at least some of the newly freed men, no women voted, no women, no age, no color, no whatever, um, the newly freed men, he intended to give some of them the vote. Now that upset one man in the audience, John Wilkes Booth. He heard this speech, and after hearing those words, he turned to a companion and said, that means nigger citizenship. Now by God, I will put him through. That will be the last speech he will ever make. Three days later, Booth carried out what he said he was going to do that night. He assassinated Abraham Lincoln. Three of his fellow conspirators were supposed to engage in assassinating William Henry Seward, the Secretary of State, and the Vice President, Andrew Johnson. Those did not succeed. Now, sometimes in history, we, we gloss over Lincoln's assassination unless we talk about the deep, dark conspiracies. We move from the end of the Civil War to Reconstruction. But Lincoln's assassination was a seminal event in American history. We lost the charismatic leader, the deft politician who had led the Union to victory in the Civil War. And what replaced him, the men who replaced him, were definitely not of his caliber. And so we lost our way. So always remember that when people sort of skip over the assassination. His assassination was, was important. It was devastating to the United States. Well, let me talk about the conspirators now. Let's move to the, to the conspirators themselves. So who we have here Obviously, Booth. I'm going to talk about him a little bit more in a minute. David Harold. David Harold was a graduate of Georgetown College, now Georgetown University. He was a pharmacist's assistant, but he was also an avid hunter. He knew all the roads in Southern Maryland. And since the original objective was of the plot was to kidnap Lincoln, the way to get Lincoln to Virginia, the safest way, was to take him through southern Maryland and across the Potomac River. David Harold knew all the roads. Next to him, George Atzerodt. George Atzerodt was a carriage painter from southern Maryland. Um, he made a pretty good living as a carriage painter. He made a better living as a smuggler, smuggling men and material across the Potomac River. So two very important people. Next to him, Lewis Powell. Lewis Powell was a former Confederate soldier. He had enlisted in the 2nd Florida. He served, the 2nd Florida was part of the Army of Northern Virginia. He was wounded at Gettysburg, 
ended up in a Union hospital, escaped from that hospital, and made his way into Northern Virginia where he joined, joined Mosby's Rangers, a very, very famous partisan band of partisan, Confederate partisan raiders. They were a real thorn in the side of the Union soldiers west, in Western Virginia. Somehow, for some reason, we don't know, Powell left Mosby's Rangers, and he met Booth. Now, Powell was six feet tall. He was in great shape. He was a trained soldier, exactly the kind of man you would need to subdue Abraham Lincoln, who was a powerful six-foot-plus tall man. I'm going to, oops, sorry. I'm going to skip down here to John Surratt. John Surratt was crucial. John Surratt was a Confederate courier. He was trusted with uh, smuggling important spies, important soldiers, and important papers through Union lines, mostly to Canada. John Surratt's Confederate contact was Secre Confederate Secretary of State Judah Benjamin. So he had access to high government levels of the Confederacy. John is the one who brought in his mother, Mary Surratt. Mary Surratt was a widow. She, as, by virtue of her widowhood, she had inherited a boarding house in Washington, D.C., which would become the central meeting point of the conspirators, and indeed harbor some of them at times. Uh, Mary Surratt also owned a tavern in Southern Maryland, which would become part of Booth's escape. Edmund Spangler, Edmund Spangler was a stagehand at Ford's Theater. Edmund Spangler knew Booth because Booth had acted many times at Ford's Theater. These two men basically go together. Michael O'Laughlin, Samuel Arnold were both childhood friends of Booth's former Confederate soldiers who had served their terms and gone back to Baltimore, where Booth met with them. And finally, Samuel Mudd. Samuel Mudd was one of the most important men in a network of Confederate sympathizers in Southern Maryland. Uh, Samuel Mudd would be very important in Booth's gathering together, hiring, if you will, all these conspirators. This is the band of conspirators. All right, John Wilkes Booth himself. Booth was the son of a famous actor. Two of his brothers were famous actors, and Booth was a famous actor. He had appeared in theaters all over the United States. He was wealthy. He was charismatic. He was witty, and he was handsome. He was also, like all of his compatriots in the plot, an ardent Southern sympathizer. He believed the South's way of life was superior. He believed that slavery was uh, a good thing for the black race. And he believed that the North had no right to meddle in Southern, in, in, with the South. Now that's those first two lines. The last line he wrote while he was fleeing after assassinating Lincoln. And if you read that, one of the things I find most interesting about that line is, it wasn't my fault, God chose me to do this. It's a very interesting line if you think about it for a moment. What these people all had in common was a hatred of Abraham Lincoln and everything he represented. So, what got Booth started? Well, essentially, Lincoln's renomination and his reelection to the presidency. Booth had wanted to enlist in the Confederate Army, but his mother begged him not to, so he didn't. Then Lincoln was reelected, and Booth said, I have to do something. And what he decided to do was, with the aid of others, kidnap Abraham Lincoln, 
take himself to Richmond, where he would be ransomed for all the Confederate prisoners in the North, which, as anyone can recognize, would have been a, would have been a real boon to the Confederate armies. That was the original plot. So the first people he went to talk to were his old friends, Michael O'Laughlin and Samuel Arnold. And he said to them, I want to kidnap the president. Here's why I want to do it. Well, they had served in the Confederate Army. They were ready to go. The next thing Booth did was go to Montreal, Canada. There was a Confederate mission in Montreal. And it, several of its staff were agents who had been sent north to disrupt the war in the north in any way, disrupt the, the war in the north disrupt peace in the North. Um, one of their plans was to send out boxes of clothing that had been worn by people with smallpox. So they were really, I mean, these, these guys were serious. Booth went to talk to them, told them about his kidnap plan, and convinced them, because he came back with two important items. First, $1,500 in gold which is somewhere around $23,000, $25,000 today. And second of all, a letter of recommendation to the network of Confederate sympathizers in Southern Maryland. So Booth took his letter of recommendation and went to meet with none other than Samuel Mudd. As I said, Samuel Mudd was an important member of the network. And Samuel Mudd spent a good deal of time working with Booth. He was seen often with Booth. One of the things you need to remember, Booth was an incredibly famous man. And if you were seen in his company, people remembered it. So Mudd was the one who introduced Booth to John Surratt. John Surratt immediately signed up. Of course he wanted to help kidnap the president. He was a Confederate courier. He was actually the closest in the group to a member of the Confederate Army. <coughs> Surratt led him to David Harold and George Atzerodt, the two men who could get Lincoln through Southern Maryland and across the river. So Booth now had several more accomplices. That we do not know how he met Lewis Powell. But Booth met Lewis Powell and recruited him. So Booth had basically his gang. But there was one more person who would join it. And that was Mary Surratt. Now, John Surratt was boarding with his mother when he wasn't off going uh, on Confederate missions. John Surratt made the boarding house the meeting place of these, the plotters. Lewis Powell boarded there for a while. Atzerodt, David Harold, um, met, and Arnold and O'Laughlin met with Booth there. That's where they had their meetings. Mary became an active part of the conspiracy. Um, she knew what Booth was doing, and on April 11th, she did a very interesting thing. As part of the kidnap plan, now I moved forward a bit here, as part of the kidnap plan, the conspirators had cached some weapons at her tavern, rope, knives, two carbines some other stuff. On April 11th, Mary Surratt, now this is the day Booth heard the speech, Mary Surratt asked one of her other boarders to take her, to rent a buggy and take her to her tavern. Mary Surratt then told John Lloyd, the man who leased the tavern, to have the carbines ready there would soon be people who would come by to pick them up. This is after the kidnap plan was over. The kidnap plan 
kidnapping plans really started back in January 1865. Booth had recruited all those people. He had his money. And there were several plans they came up with, several ideas they had, times when they thought Lincoln would be going somewhere. But it, nothing ever really happened until the 15th of March, when Booth found out that Lincoln would be visiting wounded soldiers at Campbell Hospital, which was in southern D.C. Very close, just across the river, just on the other side of a big bridge into southern Maryland. Booth gathered everyone together at a restaurant. Now, I have to, one thing here, Samuel Mudd was never involved physically in any of this until after Booth had shot Lincoln. He gathered the other conspirators and told them to wait. He would find out when Lincoln was leaving the hospital. Lincoln was well known for never being well guarded. His Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, begged him, begged him to have guards. And what did Lincoln say? He said, if someone wants to kill me, he will, no matter how many guards I have. So Lincoln always had very few guards, and they were ready for them. Unfortunately, Abraham Lincoln decided to attend a military ceremony, or fortunately. It depends on how you look at it, I guess. He decided to attend a military ceremony, so he never came to the hospital. And that was the end of kidnapping plans, because now we're in late March. The Union grip on Richmond and Petersburg was getting tighter and tighter. And so on April 2nd, Richmond fell. Jefferson Davis and his cabinet escaped, but the Union had Richmond. And then, of course, on the 11th of April, Lee surrendered. And at some point between March 17th and April, it might possibly have been that night of April the 11th, but I doubt it. Booth decided the only thing to do was to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. That was just vengeance for Abraham Lincoln. Booth found out on the morning of April 14th that Lincoln would be attending a play that night. It was published in the newspaper. And the newspaper also said U.S. Grant and his wife would be there. U.S. Grant and his wife decided to go to New Jersey that day. They weren't there. Another couple was there. So Booth first went to Mary Surratt. He gave Mary Surratt a package that morning, talked a long time with Mary. Booth was very sure of himself because he knew Ford's Theater. He had free access to Ford's Theater. He had acted there several times. He knew the construction of the theater. He knew how to get under the stage, and he knew the presidential booth. He knew that the door, whoops, sorry about that. He knew the door was, that's it. well, there we go, yes. The door was right there. The presidential chair was right there. So that afternoon, he also called to get called a meeting with Powell, David Harold, and George Atzerodt. He told Powell that his job was to kill William Henry Seward, the Secretary of State. David Harold was to go with Powell, Powell knew nothing about Washington, D.C., to ride with him to the Seward House, then get him out of Washington, D.C. Outside the city, they would all rendezvous. George Atzerodt was staying in the same hotel as the vice president. He was simply to go up to the vice president's room, knock on the door, and when the vice president opened the door, shoot him. So at 9.30 that night, John Wilkes Booth rode into the alley behind Ford's Theater, saw Edmund Spangler, gave it Edmund Spangler his horse, and said, would you take care of it? And they had a couple minutes to chat. 
that would be very, a very expensive conversation for Edmund Spangler. Booth moved through easily through the theater. He moved into the box, through the door, pulled out his Derringer, and shot Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. Lincoln was carried to a house across the street, as I'm sure everyone knows, and died the next morning. Secretary of State Seward was very, very lucky. Um, he had been in a carriage accident that week, so his entire torso was in a big splint. Powell made it into his house, knifed, not fatally, two of his sons, bludgeoned a State Department agent, got into Seward's bedroom, plunged his knife into Seward, and the knife bounced off. So he plunged it again in a different place. It slashed Seward's face. Seward bled, and Powell thought he'd done the job. He escaped, only to find Harold was gone. There was a great deal of noise in the house, and Harold thought, the police are going to come, and his horse had gotten loose. So Powell was alone in the, in the District of Columbia. George Atzerodt lost his nerve. He spent the day drinking, and that night he just walked out of the District of Columbia. Never, never made the attempt. Now, I have a famous slide here. This is the drawing of Booth leaping from the presidential box. He fell on the stage and broke the small bone in his left leg. That would cost him. And as he jumped, he yelled, Seek Semper Terranus. That is the Virginia State motto, but that's not the reason he yelled it. The meaning of that is thus always to tyrants, therefore telling people what he thought about Abraham Lincoln. Fled out Ford's theater and was gone. Now over the next few days, Atzerodt, Powell, Mary Surratt, Samuel Mudd, Michael O'Laughlin, Samuel Arnold, and Edmund Spangler were arrested and taken to the old Capitol prison. But Booth eluded Secretary of War Stanton's dragnet, in which, I might add, Lew Wallace was involved because he was the commander in Maryland. Uh, and I can tell you that, that they had people jumping through hoops to find Booth. As a matter of fact, Stanton did the amazing thing of offering a $100,000 reward. Now that was certainly a fortune for anyone who found Booth in a time when people basically made the, the ma daily wage was about a dollar a day. So this was amazing and of course it brought out a lot of witnesses or possible witnesses. Where was Booth? They still couldn't find him. What Booth had done, he and David Harold had met outside the District of Columbia. They had gone to Surratt's Tavern, and they had picked up a couple of weapons, the carbines, and a bottle of whiskey, and Booth's binoculars, which Mary Surratt had taken there that day. It was the act that would hang Mary Surratt, because Mary Surratt got her buggy, her boarder to take her down in, in a buggy again. She got to the tavern, she, she saw John Lloyd, she gave him the package, and she said, this package and the carbines and a bottle of whiskey are to be ready. There will be parties to pick them up tonight. Therefore, Mary Surratt knew something was going to happen on the 14th of April. Did she know that Booth was going to assassinate Lincoln? I don't know. Nobody will ever know, but she knew something. And that will figure big when I talk in a few minutes about what actually constituted, cons constituted a conspiracy in the 1860s. Well, the next thing... Mudd and David Harold did was they went forthwith to Dr. Mudd's house. Dr. Mudd was a physician. He was a landowner. 
Booth came in and he set Booth's leg, of course. He knew Booth. Booth had a broken leg. And he let Booth stay for the next day. Now, they had gotten there early on the morning of April 15th. They stayed until dark the next day. During that time period, Mud rode out, was riding into town to get something, ran into two friends. The two friends stopped him and said, John Wilkes Booth has shot the president. The president is dead. Samuel Mudd turned around and went home. The next day, he had Easter dinner with his cousin. It was Easter. Remember, Lincoln was shot on Good Friday. Um, and he said to his cousin at lunch, you know, I'm concerned about two men who were at the house the other night. And talked to his cousin about it, and he said, and I'd like you to go talk to the authorities in Bryantown nearby. He said, you're a unionist. I'm not. I'm known as a Southern sympathizer. You'll have an easier time. His cousin didn't go till the next day. So Booth and Harold had a two-day leave because Mudd had directed them to the next guy in the network, and that guy directed them to someone else. They had a hard time. It was hard getting across the river. There were Union patrol boats everywhere. As a matter of fact, they went out one night, almost ran, it was foggy, dead into a Union picket boat, turned around and went back to shore. They had to wait. But they finally got across the river. By the time they got across the river on the, I believe it was the 21st of April, thereabouts, 22nd of April, Booth was exhausted. Remember, he was wounded. He was hurting. So about three miles south of the Potomac River, they came to the farm of a man named Richard Garrett. And they asked Garrett to, to harbor them. David Harold told Garrett that Booth had been wounded in the defense of Richmond. And of course, being a Southern man, Garrett said, of course. And then, then well, Booth was still handsome. He was still witty. He entertained them, and he said, stay the next day. So they did. All right, the 16th New York Cavalry was hot on the trail. They had had some good information of Booth. And on the morning of the 26th, very early on the morning of the 26th of April, they found, they came to Garrett's farm. They asked Garrett whether he was harboring this fugitive, Garrett attempted to lie, but his son said, no, they're in the tobacco barn. And there they were in the barn. Now, Harold walked out and surrendered immediately. But Booth stayed in the barn. So they set the barn on fire. And through cracks in the barn, they could see Booth with one of the carbines and a, and a revolver. And so... One cavalryman decided to shoot. He shot Booth, he severed Booth's spinal cord, and Booth died within a half an hour. So, they now had everyone. And I'm going to digress here for a minute because I think this there, is. There's one person they didn't have. Who? John Surratt. Yes, yes, you're right. Thank you. John Surratt was in, had taken someone to northern New York. When he found out about it, he was smuggled into Canada. So during this entire time, he was in Canada. Later on, he would be smuggled to out of Canada, go to Europe, serve in the Papal Guard. Yeah, which I think is an interesting commentary. But he was Catholic, and his friends in Canada were Catholics, and I suspect there was a connection there. So... Uh, he would be brought back. He would be found out in 1866. He would be brought back for trial, and a civil jury in Washington, D.C. would try him, and it would end up in a hung jury. So John Surratt, in fact, in, in fact escaped. Which brings me, thank, way, thank you, perfect segue to this. Why was there this enormous dragnet 
this enormous energy and effort put into this because quite frankly the American the Union people in the North were truly angry they saw this as the last terrible act of a dying Confederacy they had been celebrating their joy had turned to enormous mourning and they were angry now when people ask me about this I say well I want everybody and I'm asking you tonight to remember how you felt after 9-11 and if any of the perpetrators of that crime had been caught how would you have felt it's a really important thing to remember plus there was an element of an element of fear in this there were still two Confederate armies in the field and Jefferson Davis was still at large so perhaps without Lincoln the Confederacy would be able to reconstitute itself and the war might begin again so I think this whole and if anybody wants a good book the title is beware the public weeping it is an excellent book beware the people weeping, beware the people weeping. not the public beware the people and I've got a list of books at the end of this okay so here we have the conspirators who went on trial with the exception of the man in red here John Surratt what were they charged with they were charged with combining confederating and conspiring to murder Abraham Lincoln to murder William Seward Andrew Johnson and US Grant conspiring the crime was conspiracy in 1865 the legal definition of a conspiracy was two or more persons who conspire to commit any offense against the US or any agency thereof thereof in any manner or for any purpose there were four elements of a conspiracy an agreement between at least two parties to achieve an illegal goal a knowledge of the conspiracy and participation in the conspiracy a conspirator at least one conspirators commission of an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy now a person might be a member of an unlawful conspiracy without knowing all the details of the conspiracy or even the other members of the conspiracy these are the things that would trap Samuel Mudd and Mary Surratt the law also stated that if a felony was committed in furtherance of a conspiracy even though the original goal was only a misdemeanor the charge was the commission of the felony in this case homicide the law also involved the concept of vicarious responsibility anyone in a conspiracy is responsible for the actions of the others and the only way in which you could not be called a conspirator was to make an effort more than an effort was to make a successful effort to tell the authorities what was happening none of these people did that and if you think about this this is the net that captured all of them so they were also going to be tried by a military commission which in later eras would be thought of as a terrible thing this is a picture of the commission now the actual commissioners are the men to the left of this of this civilian and you'll recognize Lou Wallace right there and I might add Lou Wallace was the only lawyer on the Commission this is Major General David Hunter by virtue of his, of his rank he was the president of the Commission all of these men were fighters they were fighting generals and of course they all had an adherence to Abraham Lincoln the man on the far right is Brigadier General Joseph Holt the judge advocate general 
His job was to administer military justice within the continental United States. He was an excellent lawyer. He was a man of detail. And he, though he was from Kentucky, was a strong, staunch unionist. This is, but uh, Holt did not actually prosecute the trial. He was not the prosecutor. He oversaw the trial, but he didn't prosecute. This is the chief prosecutor, John Bingham. The new president, Andrew Johnson, the attorney general, Joshua Speed, and Holt decided the conspirators should be tried by a military commission. Why? It was military crime. They had tried to kill the commander in chief. And by killing, trying to kill Seward, trying to kill Johnson, and even thinking they were going to kill Grant, they had tried to behead if you will, the United States military organization. So it had to be a military trial because it was a military crime. The trial opened on May 9, 1865 and concluded with sentencing on June 30th. The public went along with the idea of a military commission. There was absolutely no public outcry at the time. Why? Because throughout, Abraham Lincoln had suspended the writ of habeas corpus in 1862. Um, and his suspension held that civilians engaged in activity and supportive of the Confederacy were subject to martial law and liable to trial and punishment by courts, martial, or military commissions. So there were hundreds of trials by military commission in the North, people who had tried to aid and abet the Confederacy. Here, a lot of the Copperheads were tried by military commission. The public was used to this. They thought it was appropriate because these people were trying to overthrow the legitimate government of the United States. They were not kangaroo courts. There were standard rules of procedure. There was meticulous record keeping, which didn't happen in the civilian courts at the time. The records of the courts were reviewed this court in particular, by Holt every day. And if a sentence of death was passed, the president had to read all the records and sign I to the death sentences. However, these courts allowed hearsay testimony and leading questions. And the judge advocate, the chief prosecutor, in this case Bingham, had to pass on all prosecution, and defense witnesses. Now, unfair? Well, there was a concept at the time of military commissions, and that is that military men were men of honor and would seek to find the truth, to get at the truth by all means in their power, and not to discuss points of law. And honor a conscientious adherence to substantial justice. These men would behave with honor. And that was the thing that, it's a different era now, that people believed then. They were all honorable men. The defense attorneys, according to the newspapers, were a sound and accomplished group of lawyers. And they were. Um, some of them were actually quite prominent lawyers. A total of 366 witnesses were called during the trial. Of course, Powell, Atzerodt, Harold, they had no chance. Harold had been caught with Booth. Powell had been identified as the man that attacked Seward. And Atzerodt had a big mouth. He couldn't resist 
as he was fleeing Northwest talking to people about what he knew about the assassination. Well, let's talk about Mary Surratt first. The man who had taken her to the tavern both times was a man named Louis Weichmann. He was a boarder in her boarding house. He was a friend of John Surratt's. He was also a member of a Union Reserve Regiment and an employee of the federal government. And I've never been able to figure out why they all trusted him, because Weichmann was around all the time. He saw Booth moving in and out. He saw all the other conspirators moving out. He knew there was something going on. And he carried Mary Surratt twice to Surratt's tavern. Now, he never overheard the conversations, but the other major witness against Mary Surratt was the man who was leasing the tavern, who had heard her say twice, there will be parties by to pick up these weapons. And on April 14th, there will be someone here tonight. So Mary Surratt had almost no hope. And then what happened? Lewis Powell had boarded at her boarding house. He didn't know where else to go, so he went to her boarding house. <laughs> when he got there, there were federal agents there. And he told them, well, I came to dig a ditch for her. And she said, I never saw that man before. <laughs> this did not work out. So they both ended up in uh, the old Arsenal prison. There is no convincing evidence against Edmund Spangler, except that he took care of Booth's horse and he talked to Booth. Um, apparently, the commission just believed he couldn't, ha couldn't, he had to have been involved. But there is no convincing evidence. The attorney for Arnold and O'Loughlin said, but, but they only thought they were going to participate in a kidnapping. Well, we've heard what constitutes a conspiracy. They also had no chance of escaping because they were part of the conspiracy. They were part of the conspiracy to kidnap Lincoln. And what could have happened to Lincoln during kidnapping? Lincoln could have been killed. So Arnold, that, was, that turned out to be no excuse. Mudd's defense was ba based on his status as a doctor and landowner and a gentleman. And he also said, I didn't know Booth. Well, people crawled out of the woodwork to say, we've seen him with Booth. He's been around in Southern Maryland with Booth. Um, they also, I think one of the final items was federal agents searched his house. And under, under a bed in the house, they found a boot, which had obviously been cut off somebody's leg with Jay Wilkes in it. So he knew who he was treating. He knew, according to testimony, that Booth had assassinated Lincoln. He kept Booth. He sent him on. So Mudd, Mudd was in trouble. Now, or was he? Um, on June 26th, Lou Wallace wrote his wife. You'll remember the trial decision was made on June 30. And what Wallace wrote is really interesting. Tomorrow the commission votes guilty or not guilty. I have passed a few words with my associate members and think we can agree in a couple of hours. Three, if not four of the eight will be acquitted. Acquitted. That is, they would be if we voted today. What effect Bingham, the chief prosecutor who is going to summarize the next day, will have remains to be seen. Three, if not four. Okay, well, that has to be Arnold O'Loughlin and Spangler, the three, and I'm betting the fourth was Samuel Mudd. Acquitted. Well, Bingham made a very powerful argument, obviously, because everyone was found guilty. Spangler, Arnold, O'Loughlin, and Mudd were to go to prison. Spangler for six years, Arnold, O'Loughlin, and Mudd for lifetimes. They were to go to Fort Jefferson. Fort Jefferson 
is a, still there, a fort in the dry Tortugas off Florida. In the 1860s, it was a hell hole. It was disease killed hundreds there. As a matter of fact, um, Michael O'Laughlin died there in 1867 of yellow fever. Spangler, Mudd, and Arnold did not because a few days before he left office, Andrew Johnson pardoned them for reasons of his own. <laughs> Powell, Harold, Atzerodt, and Mary Surratt were sentenced to death by hanging. There was a plea of clemency for Mary Surratt by five of the members of the commission. Lou Wallace was not one of them. There is a theory, and that was part, if any of you saw the movie The Conspirators a few years ago, that was part of this movie, that Mary Surratt was sentenced to death in hopes of bringing in her son John because they all believed John was the connection with the Confederate government that, who could give evidence against Jefferson Davis, Judah Benjamin, and others. John Surratt was in Canada, about to be smuggled to Europe. He didn't hear about his mother's death until long after he was gone. So it was a faint hope. They were hanged on July 7th. And what I find very interesting about this comment they made in an editorial was that the justice of the verdict would, be, would meet the, command the approval of history. Well, it hasn't. We've been over Mary Surratt. We've been over Samuel Mudd. We've been over all, many of them, over and over. All I can say in conclusion is I believe they were all guilty of the crime they were accused of, conspiracy. Was it fair to hang Mary Surratt? Who knows? Um, I just, it was, that was the crime, and they were guilty. And it was proven. And those men of honor did the right thing. And Mary Surratt, last word, Mary Surratt was more guilty than the others. It was simply because she carried that package and she went to her tavern and she said, parties will be by here tonight. And she had talked to Booth that morning. So she knew something was up. She could, and she knew of the plan to kidnap the president. She might have thought something's going to happen to Abraham Lincoln tonight. And she didn't talk to anybody. All right, on to the Wallace painting. Lou Wallace, who loved art, as you loved being an artist, as you all know, was made sketches of the conspirators during the trial. And they're pretty good. And he used these sketches to produce this painting, The Conspirators. He painted this in 1867-1868. Now this was an era when everybody was trying to put the Civil War in the rear view, view mirror. Why did Lou Wallace paint it? Well, we should all remember that right after the war, Wallace went to Mexico. He raised a huge amount of money, put some of his own into it, put some of Henry Smith Lane's into it, had hundreds of contributors. He bought a shipload of weapons, and he went to Mexico to help the legitimately elected president of Mexico, Benito Juarez, deposed Maximilian, who had been, on, been put on the throne by a French army. And indeed, Wallace's weapons equipped two of those armies. And Juarez deposed Maximilian. Maximilian was shot. Well, Juarez loved the weapons. He didn't want the gringo. He didn't want it said that any North American had helped him regain his office. Wallace's payment, he thought, was to be concessions, mining concessions, a concession to put up a telegraph system. He got nothing. He came back to the United States personally poor, having, if you will, misspent the money of a lot of other people. And I think he painted this painting to remind himself, I was a success. I was important. 
I did something good. Because it was a rough time for him. He had to be a lawyer again, for one thing, which we all know he hated. <laughs> so, Wallace's only commentary on the painting was published in the Crawfordsville Journal in March of 1868. He had a small gathering at his house, and he showed them the painting and talked about it briefly. He said, some of the faces are very strong, especially those of Booth, Mud, and Surratt, who he called the brains of the conspiracy. Samuel Mudd, one of the brains of the conspiracy. This is Lou Wallace. He said, and this is the thing that always bothered me, Powell is standing, drawn to his full height. He was a desperate character, according to Wallace. And during the trial, whenever he found himself, the object of attention would draw himself up to his full proportions and glare at the crowd like a caged tiger. This is, Wallace was clearly impressed by the ferocity of this man. But what I look at more is the way they're placed. This is definitely second tier here. Way over here on the right, all by himself, is Edmund Spangler. I'm betting Lou Wallace thought this guy really didn't have anything to do with this. We've got Arnold and O'Loughlin, sort of kind of below, almost below the, rock, the stones. This is Atzerodt, mm, kind of hanging on this second level of stones. And Payne, Powell, was standing on top of this second level of stones. And straddling here is David Harold. To me, that says to me, these people were part of it, but they weren't as important. What I find really interesting is the placement of John Surratt, but I think Wallace believed like everybody else did. This guy had ties to the Confederacy. He could have, he could have been the conduit for Confederate help, and we couldn't try him. He wasn't on trial. And Samuel Mudd, I find that fascinating. It tells me that Lou Wallace was not one of the guys who would have voted to acquit Samuel Mudd. They're also front and center. That's what I think about this painting. Now, of course, there's one other big question. And that is, where is Mary Surratt? Whoops. Well, Wallace always said he couldn't draw Mary Surratt. He never saw her face. She wore a heavy black veil. Well, yes, she did, but she was forced to raise it every day. And the commissioners looked at her to make sure she was Mary Surratt, that no one else was under that veil. And someone, because this appeared just post-trial, was able to draw her, and it's a good likeness. So why didn't Lou Wallace draw Mary Surratt? Well, <clears throat> and why didn't he include her in his painting? After her hanging, almost immediately after she was hanged, it's one of those right turn things that people do, the hanging of Mary Surratt became a huge controversy. Huge. And as it got worse as the years went on, it became a political question for candidates. And Lou Wallace would be accused when he ran for a congressman he would be asked again and again, why did you vote to hang Mary Surratt? And so it was something of a needle in his side. Now, this is one of my theories. He didn't put her in there because he didn't want to call attention. He didn't want to have them see Mary. He didn't want to have anyone see Mary Surratt in his painting. And he didn't want to paint her. But, of course, he may not have been able to draw her. We'll never know. And finally, if anybody wants to read what I consider to be the best books on the Lincoln assassination, there they are. So thank you very much for listening for so long, ladies and gentlemen. And I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.
Rosil, is that because she was the first woman? She was the first woman hanged by the federal government. But I think in that era, hanging a woman, a white woman, was not done. Definitely not done. Stephanie. So I did a lot of tours, of course, of the study, and I get asked a couple of questions frequently. Sure. Why did he paint them looking heroic is something that a lot of visitors ask me. And then they see it, they, they look at this painting differently than you do. They say, why is John Wilkes Booth a footnote and that big guy that we've never oh. heard of before? And, and, and so I, your, your interpretation fascinates me, but do you have any thoughts on that? Um, first of all, except for Payne, Powell, I don't think anybody looks heroic in that. If you look at them, I mean, these guys are literally cowering behind the blocks. Mm -hmm. And Booth is an odd color. Yeah. And I think that's probably because Booth's dead. It's the only thing I can think. And mud looks very shady to me. And a John Surratt, well, I don't think they look heroic. Again, the only one would be Powell, and that's because, because Wallace... Wallace's attention was drawn to him, and he must have, Powell, Powell was a physically imposing man. Now, what was the other part of the question? They look heroic? I think you got them both. Okay, good. Yes, sir. How, how far was Ford Theater from the White House? Oh, it was, it's close. It's around today. It's pretty close. It's not like across the street. But I'd say, well, in today's traffic, uh, but I'd say 20 eight minutes, eight maybe? Seven or eight blocks. Seven or eight blocks. So. 16th and 10th and okay. 10th and Okay. Eight. So close, but not that close. It wasn't like they could get him to the White House in time. That took him across the street. Sir? Now, there are so many side stories that came from the Lincoln assassination. Mm -hmm. uh, Major Rathbone. I think is a yes. story, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, and a tragic story. Mm -hmm. And of course, his wife wore the dress, or his fiance at the time, later his wife, right. uh, which had the most of the president's blood on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, they supposedly hid the dress, they bricked it in in the back of their closet, and uh, Major Rathbone uh, never got over being in the boot there. He thought that he should have saved Abraham Lincoln yeah. from being assassinated. And he later killed his wife when they got into a big argument, you know. Yeah. And the dress was found by their son, and mm -hmm. he destroyed it. So, uh, there are a lot of tragic things. stories, yes. Rath, Major Rathbone and his fiancée, Clara Harris, I believe, were the couple that went with the Lincolns that night to Ford's Theater. Uh, Rathbone was a major in the Union Army. Um, they sat over to the side. Let's see if I can get back to that. They sat over to the side of the box and right over in here. I think she was, Clara was there and the major was there. Well, this was a total surprise. I mean, John Wilkes Booth crept up. He shot Lincoln before anybody even realized what had happened. Rathbone leapt up. And Booth had, and you probably saw, Booth had a huge knife. He had a Bowie knife with him. He pulled out the knife and he slashed Rathbone's arm to the bone. So Rathbone's trying to fight this man with a bleeding arm and he couldn't get to Booth. And of course, if you witnessed a presidential assassination, you'd have, I'm sure, psychological issues for years thereafter. So it was a terrible thing. It was a terrible thing that night. It was something nobody was expecting. Nobody. It's a play. Everybody's happy. The war's over. Boom. The war's not over. Or, yes, the war is over. Did you have a question? Well, I, this, I've always heard, I think, the saying, his name is Mud. Does that come from Oh, yeah. As a matter of fact, Ed Steers wrote a book called His Name is Still Mud. Yes. Yes. The family of Mudd, especially his grandson, I believe it was, mounted a full-throated defense of Samuel Mudd and did so well. They sent letters to presidents starting with Eisenhower and both Carter and Reagan 
sent letters back that were made public saying, we believe you, we don't think he was guilty, but we can't pardon him. Only Andrew Johnson could have done that. And it's, um, it's unfortunate because it's only, if you'll pardon, it's only muddied the waters, so to speak. <laughs> Sir. You just said that um, John Wilkes Booth stabbed um, Rathbone. He slashed Rathbone's arm. Tell me again who Rathbone is. Rathbone was the man who was in, you remember I said a couple replaced U.S. Grant and his wife? Rathbone was the male in that couple, and Clara Harris, his fiancée, was the the other person. I'm, I don't remember what Rathbone's position was, but Clara Harris knew Mary Lincoln quite well. Uh, Sir? What about Lincoln's one guard? Was it across the street at the tavern? Yeah, that yeah, was... and I think, again, Stanton wanted him to be really well guarded, and Lincoln absolutely refused. He had a sort of, Lincoln did have a fatalistic attitude about life. If he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me, and he did. So, any more questions? I was just going to point out that Weissman, the man that yes. fighting against Mary's Rod, his life did not go real well no. in Washington, and he finally decided to leave, and he ended up living the rest of his life in Anderson here, and passed away. He had a huh. I didn't know he lived sister. in Indiana. His sister was actually his sister, and I think his brother was a, a Catholic priest. Hmm. Yeah. He was the one that Wallace said uh, he'd never seen a young man put through such a searching uh, inquisition, I think Wallace called it, and do so well. We do have a blog post about him on our website. Also. Ah, okay. Uh, just, just one more comment. Of course, Mary Todd Lincoln had close relatives that were yes. Confederates. Which is she did, yes. The one that there in Lincoln's wife had cousins that were in the Confederate right. Army. Right. Uh, people that were sympathizers, and here he was president of the union. So right. it was quite a it was hard. To be in. Yes, it's hard. Sir? Uh, about Wallace, why was he chosen to be the head of this institution? To be on the commission? I think because um, Wallace was commander of the middle department of Maryland and Delaware and worked. There was a lot of trade of, Confe there were a lot of Confederate sympathizers in Maryland. There were a lot of trials. Wallace m made sure that Stanton knew what he was doing in Maryland, got Stanton's acquiescence to some stuff. And then when Stanton started the dragnet for Booth, Wallace worked very hard to find people to do exactly what Stanton ordered him to do. And I think Stanton was just pleased with Wallace and the way Wallace was an on-the-job man. Plus, lest I forget, Stanton, after the Battle of Monocacy, called Wallace in and said, you saved Washington. So he knew Wallace was um, a full-on union man, and he may have known Wallace was a lawyer. I don't know. He may have actually wanted a lawyer on the commission. Anybody? Ma'am. Would you tell me again or tell us again what Mary Surratt she was the first lady that was hanged. By the federal oh, government. By the federal government. Yes, yes. Uh, and it was, you didn't hang women at that time. Um, and I think it was a shock. I think that's why a lot of people turned because they didn't expect it. And I'm not even sure that the people like Holt, and, the, and the, the commissioners themselves really thought she'd be hanged because, again, there's this whole issue of would that bring in John Surratt. But then everybody assumed John Surratt was somewhere either in the Confederacy or in the North and would see the news and would come to his mother's rescue. But he didn't because he, he was gone. 
he was in Canada. He was in hiding. So he probably didn't find out about it until after she was hanged. Until after she was hanged. Ma'am. One more question about the painting. Mm-hmm. Those odd blocks of oh. stone cement yes. have always just looked so strange in the midst of that exterior painting. Is that some sort of art? Yes. That actually is, is um, Wallace painted them at the second inaugural. They had just finished, in, in essence, almost rebuilding the dome of the Capitol. And so there were big blocks of limestone lying around. We know Booth was there. We have a picture of him but there, but um, none of the other consp conspirators. That was just, that was a perfect setting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, if I may, uh, Wolf was a very talented artist, and he does something in there I think is very clever and very good. Uh, Payne, I think it is, who has a, half of his body is sticking up right there in the, near the center. He frames that in front of a white cloud to make it stand out more. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes, that is, yes. Wallace was a talented artist, and this, I think, is one of his best. One of his best things. Come see the original at the Yes. Uh, <laughs> fully restored, and in the cleaning and the restoration process, we saw things came out um, that had not been seen before. So if, if you saw it years ago, it's it's um, it's worth a second visit. So I encourage you to come. Gail's going to hang around for a little bit if you have questions, and we do have books if you wanted to sign one. Um, please feel free. So without any further ado, thank you, Gail, very much. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.